Hi, this is Phil Wakenall. When we started Ideas on Stage 10 years ago, Gar Reynolds was one of the key influencers and leaders we followed. His book, Presentation Zen, is what inspired us to become presentation specialists. And now Presentation Zen is entering its third edition. So my colleague Rose Bloomfield caught up with Gar to learn what's new in Presentation Zen third edition and with special appearances from Queen, Steve Jobs and Yoda. Enjoy. Gar, can you tell us what was your original inspiration for writing Presentation Zen for those who've never heard about it? Yeah. So if it's your first time, I, I began, I mean, my interest in presentation was when, began when I was in high school. So that's a very long time ago. And we used 35 millimeter slides on two Kodak carousels. And it was just, you know, it was like the ability to become sort of like a filmmaker or at least a, a TV news anchor, because it's, in those days, 35 millimeter slides, they're beautiful, very visual on a big screen. Um, and it was presenting often in those days, it was kind of in the dark because that to make the 35 millimeter slides look good, you're kind of uh, in the dark in those days. But you know, it's me standing there and talking about, you know, in those days, uh, pollution, we didn't call it climate change, but you know, different, you know, science related things in high school. Um, and so that's kind of where my love of standing in front of people telling the story with uh, visuals together. So this was long before uh, PowerPoint was invented. Uh, then when Steve Jobs came back to Apple, I was still in Japan then, but when he came back to Apple in 90, seven or something like that, I started watching his keynotes. And it was very small in those days um, on, on the internet. And I was very inspired by, by him as a presenter. I always felt you know, that, that that's the way I liked presenting. That's what I thought presentation was. And then I looked more closely at the way the Apple uh, people were doing out in the field. And of course, Steve Jobs keynote. And I just sort of, yeah, I just was very interested in that. Uh, then, uh, I forget what year, but gosh, almost 20 years, then I went to work for Apple. So because I was out there presenting, um, I mean, it's a good example of how do you get a new job rather than, you know, sending in resumes. I was just out there giving stuff away for free, talking about, you know, technology things and some Mac things. Uh, and then Apple, some people at Apple saw that, and then they asked me to come present at Apple, and I did that, and eventually I just, uh, they asked me to work there. So I began working there in the early beginning of this century and then i left around 2003 to come back to japan because i'm i'm in love with japan so the the book was 13 years ago but before that around 2005 i did the uh, presentationsend.com which is just uh giving everything away for free i had no intention of uh, writing a book but for several years i was blogging not every day because it wasn't like a seth godin blog which is great but he's almost every day you know a little 50 words or 300, 400 words, but I would, you know, research and, uh, and put something up at least once a week, but sometimes uh, three or four times a week. Different videos pointing to different presenters. And then when Ted went online around 2006, I think, that was, you know, that was amazing uh, because, wow, here we can point to uh, scientists and other really intelligent people, uh, creative people with a message and a story but presenting it in a way that's uh, very visual and fits the, the medium of the, of the internet in those days. So uh, then it just really took off. I mean, I, and you know, the blog really took off and I really loved doing that. And then a few publishers asked me if they, well, you might as well just put this in a book, in book form, right? So uh, I did that, I guess around 14 years ago, I started writing it, it came out 13 years ago. And now this is the third edition of that, of that book. So it's the same book. Uh, of course, otherwise I would write a different book, which I had done. Um, but, you know, it's 10% maybe, or 15% of the text was removed. Another additional 15% was added. There's new visuals. Uh, almost all the visuals were updated to reflect, you know, the 16 by 9, of course, is the standard if we're using slides. So 4 by 3 looks a little bit uh, dated. It's still appropriate in some cases, uh, if you know... Right you know, that, you, that it will work, that a four by three will fit a beautiful four by three screen. But generally speaking, uh, we're going at least 16 by nine and often even wider than that. Great. Wow. So you basically just also gave us a rundown on the history of presenting in the last uh, 15 or 20 years in terms of the big head honchos Apple that led the way with how a keynote can look and sound and feel. Um, and also the concept of giving away for free as a launch pad. 
Um, and I think that that's really, really being adopted today. I know we're seeing it a lot and being a, a thought leader is how you break in. Um, so from your blog, presentationzen.com, to then being asked to write the book. And now, yes, looking at the, the third edition of your book, um, where the visuals have been updated, and I, you know, you said 15% of the text was taken out and a uh, new 15% was added uh -huh. in. Um, I have a question for you there, but before uh -huh. I go into it, I'm taking a pause. Now that you've given us this background on Presentation Zen, the first edition, mm -hmm. you mentioned that you took out about 15% of the text and added in a new 15%. Can you share us, with us a little bit about what that new text includes and, and does that perhaps reflect yeah. changes in the presentation world? Uh uh, not really so much on the latter. I mean, there are some, because I never get into the software anyway, that, that's not what it's about. So not that much has changed, a, a little bit. So for example, I had a call out, two page call out on the difference between four by three and 16 by nine slides and why, you know, we sh why we should use 16 by nine usually and what that is. You'd be, su be surprised most people, I mean, most business people, academics, whatever, don't really think about it. So they show up at conferences and these beautiful 16 by nine screens and they have their four by three slides on them. And, you know, it's just, it's a small thing, but it, it looks unprofessional. Uh, it looks bad. So, you know, that kind of thing. Um, you know, this is the third time around. It, it was done the first time, but it's a new group of editors uh, and publisher and they went through it again. So the writing is just better because, you know, you always go through and they, they, they made it better. And better means usually taking out. I mean, if you can say it in five words rather than ten words, and that's a better sentence. So just that's a, little a bit. really important point. I think we there's a, a quote we like to use, which is "Don't let the superfluous dilute the essential." In fact, it's possible that Phil said that or made that quote. I'm forgetting where it okay. comes from. <laughs> yeah, I think the founder of Ideas on Stage says that. I love it. It's true. So what can you take away? Yeah. So you know, it's a little bit. It's a little better in that regard. Uh, in terms of other content, there's thing, um, different call outs, like something on forest bathing, Japanese forest bathing, what, and what that means. That's related to the uh, preparation stage of getting out. There's actual scientific evidence coming from, uh, I think, Tokyo Institute of Technology, uh, one of the Tokyo universities that shows that uh, actually being in nature, being um, among the trees uh, can physically, uh, it, it was healthy, it physically makes you healthier. Of course, we know it. You know, emotionally, it makes us feel better, but in the long term, uh, it can actually be good for us. So it's, and we know it's good for creativity, just getting out, getting away from the city, getting away from people uh, by ourselves in, in the forest. So it was relevant, so I put that in there, and it fits the, the theme of the book. Uh, there's even a two-page call out on Queen, so there's Freddie Mercury and Brian May are in there, and the lessons learned from Live Aid in 1985. So I wrote something about that. Uh, we got permission for uh, some photos from that event. And so I was happy to put that in. So some of my heroes are, are in there. Of course, there's JFK and there's Steve Jobs, uh, but now there's Brian May and, and Freddie Mercury. Uh, Dave Grohl has a call out in there from the Foo Fighters. Uh, I mean, he's just, I love what he says about uh, communication in terms of uh, music or, or art, and that it's not perfect. We're not trying to be perfect. We're not going for perfection. I mean, we are going for perfection, but we'll never get it. Uh, and it's the striving for that. And it's okay that it's not perfect. It's much more important that it be real and honest and authentic. In fact, we saw Queen just uh, last week, one week ago tonight, we saw Queen at Osaka That's Dome, 55,000 people. It was a great show, uh, unbelievable monitors. And we are really far away up in, the, up in the, uh, these box seats high in the stadium. But because the screens are now, it's amazing uh, screens that they had. Um, but Brian had even said that on his Instagram, Brian May had said that on Instagram uh, about that concert, is that he would, how wonderful it was and how perfect he felt it was. But of course he said parenthetically, it wasn't perfect. That's not the point. The point is we did the best we could and it, we were on and it was a great night. Of course, it's not technically always perfect. We don't even notice that kind of thing. I mean, I've seen presentations that you could say were perfect. Every word was said perfectly. Every slide was, you know, perfect. Uh, that were just flat, very corporate. I mean, you'd often see that difference back in the day when Steve Jobs would present. And his slides, of course, were perfect. I mean, he was perfect, but I mean, his, his way of speaking was conversational. 
So that means it's not always, you know, perfect when it's live like that. But once in a while, he'd have a, someone from a different company come out. And it was, they were just so corporate. And, you know, they, they were so worried about being perfect. And you, it, you could really see the difference when it's that sort of corporate, stiff, very, you know, politicians are often like that mm -hmm. as well. And Steve Jobs, although he had many faults, um, he was brilliant at that kind of large keynote or presentation, make, making it feel really uh, natural. So mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot to learn from his approach to that presenting even on the big stage. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks for, for sharing with us about the new version of your book. And so what I'm hearing in terms of key themes that we can watch out for in getting the, the third edition of Presentation Zen is notes about the change and um, improvements in technology for one. What, yeah. what were, no, not as much? Uh, no, a little bit. Like I said, it's not about technology at all because it's so ephemeral. It changes so much and the books right. become so dated <laughs> like that. So sure. I don't really uh, talk about uh, technology uh, really at all. Okay. Um, I do mention a few uh, companies where you can get good templates. I mean, I'm not, I don't really care about templates, but Canva is one of them. And right. uh, there's some others that people really like. Um, um, and then the 16 by nine, the, if I can just get people to use a wide screen for, I mean, wide slides for a wide screen, that, that would be brilliant. It sounds like that's a very important point. Yeah. You've mentioned that a few times. So well, everyone, 16 it's, by nine it is, I mean, it's a small thing, but you know, I mean, yeah. We gotta let go of the four by three. Although sometimes we need to work within the projector screen. So you gotta work with what you've got, but yeah. whenever available, go for the wide screen. And what else? So I also heard, and I think this is really important, it's something we're paying attention to as well. Um, communication and transformation through communication is what's core for ideas on stage. Our main audience is usually business professionals. So we work a lot with CEOs or people in the boardroom or a new manager who needs to improve their speaking so that people can understand what they're saying and really get the impact of their work and contribution. Mm -hmm. Gar, who would you say is your main audience normally? Who are you talking to? Oh, well, that, you know, that's a good question because it's marketing 101. If you say everybody, then it's nobody. Yeah, academic, medical, tech. Oh, and of course, how could I forget this? Uh, education. Uh, a lot of teachers, because the teachers are presenting themselves, but perhaps more importantly, they're helping students uh, learn how to present, to present their work. And there's very, you know, many different ways. And it's not always about using slides, of course. And I, mean, I don't teach uh, using slides, almost not at all. So I use whiteboard uh, for almost everything and try to uh, teach students how to use the whiteboard in real time, but also how to give presentations, how to prepare a nice 15 minute, 20 minute talk in sort of like the, the TED style, um, but perhaps go a little bit deeper. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of teachers actually. So you, you mentioned authenticity, you mentioned TED. Um, I would say that TED is a style that has really made a huge impact on the world of what we expect in presentations and what we expect from public speaking today. Um, do you want to say a few words about the trend that you're seeing today? And, and I come back to that word you mentioned yeah. of authenticity and perhaps maybe some, a little bit of wisdom to share with those who are interested in continuing to develop their public speaking skills. Oh, uh, well, you, you mentioned TED. So, I mean, everyone knows about TED now and of course it's great. And I've been to TED uh, a few times and done TED many, I haven't done a TED talk. I've done many TEDx talks. Um, and, you know, I loved it. I was there, I think, I mean, I was blogging as soon about the, the next day after they put uh, videos up in 2006, I think it was. But, you know, like anything, when it becomes very popular, then it becomes, it can become a cliche, I guess, when you're having parodies uh, of your work, then you know you've made it. And I think the parodies are fair. There are some, some talks that it just becomes sort of... Um, you, you know, you should give a TED talk, not because you want to give a TED talk. You give a TED talk because you have something to say that you feel is important, that, that you want to share. And sometimes it's happened where people really just want to give a TED talk <laughs> for, to get their name out there or for, rec for recognition or their, um, it, it just doesn't connect right. It feels a little uh, stuffy, a little bit rehearsed. Um, and that's very different than the old days when things were less perfect a little bit less polished, and I liked it uh, better, frankly, that way. But for the most part, 
Uh, they're really good. And, you know, the TEDx uh, Kyoto that we have just down the road here is, is fabulous. And a friend of mine, Jay, who's the producer there, he does a really good job. And he, he's a TEDster himself. So, you know, above all, keep it authentic. Let's not, you know, we don't want this to be artificial. We try to get people with really important uh, things to say, a lot of scientists and medical people. But it, it doesn't matter. It's different, you know, uh, sorts of genres from music and other, uh, the arts and so on. But I think you really need to be focused on the message and the audience, not on how will this help my career or sell books or whatever it is. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'm not speaking. Oh, I can't agree with you more. TED is all about ideas worth spreading, as you said. Right. So, Bar, I want to ask you, you mentioned perfection, that we can't achieve it, but we can strive for it. Yeah, a lot of uh, TEDx's, uh, and maybe TED does this themselves in, in Canada now, or where they do it is where the presenters basically memorize everything and then pretend that it's not memorized, which is really, really hard. That's the hardest way to do it. So what you don't see is, is that some, sometimes a presenter just freezes up and forgets what they're gonna say, and then they just splice it together so you, you don't actually see that. I've never done, I, I would just be terrifying to have to memorize something. So uh, I think a much better approach is the way that a lot of us do, and it's the way Steve Jobs always did his keynotes. It's not memorized, even though it, it wasn't written word for word. Now the slides are like little storyboards. So he knows what he's going to say here and here and here and here, but it isn't memorized in, in that way. I, I know it or whoever, Steve Jobs, he, of course he knows it cold and he could do it without the visuals, or at least he could do the gist of it without the visuals that prompts him. But it, it isn't memorized because very few of us have that sort of the memory that could, um, to actually pull that off and, and do it in a way that seems natural. I saw George uh, Take, yeah, Take, not Take, George Take uh, from Star Trek. And he, um, he presented for a special TEDx Kyoto event we had. And I was there at rehearsal in the front row uh, working with him and he did like, it's almost 20 minutes, I think. And no slides, of course, just him. And it was memorized. He's an actor, he's a professional actor. You know George, George Take, it's this beautiful glow voice and he told this great story you can see it on, on ted.com and it was perfect and then you know an hour later he did it for the actual show and it was exactly the same and it, he's a professional actor and they can do that but for most of us we can't do that so that approach where you're not reading it but you have these slides uh, it could be visuals where you're just going through and it's kind of like show and tell when we were kids and it doesn't have to be polished it doesn't have to be perfect. Now, it, it shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing it for, as if you've seen the slides for the first time, which often happens in Japanese meetings, where it's the click and it's a, ah, so this, ne, e, do, ne. like you're seeing, ah, okay, um, yes, so, well, okay, about that. No, you have to know, that obviously you've, <laughs> you've put this together, so it's your presentation. Sometimes happens is, with leaders is that someone else puts the presentation together you know, gives them the remote control and, you know, ta-da, and it's almost as if they're seeing it for the first time. So I uh, highly recommend that leaders, uh, CEOs or whomever, uh, actually make the presentations or make it with someone. Someone can do the visuals, but, uh, and of course, that's the way Steve Jobs did it. He was very much on top of it. And I think a lot of the best presenters, of course, are on top of it. Thank you. Again, couldn't agree more. Definitely see that a lot where a CEO or a leader is receiving and discovering something live and turning their back to the audience and we're getting to see their lovely backside and it's just not why people came. Look, uh, in a way, I was doing TED Talks before TED was even invented. Like I said, I was in high school in the 70s making what, that's the way I thought, I mean, we've been talking presenting this way, I suppose, for centuries in a way around the campfire. It was uh, Dana, Dana Atchley, Dana Atchley, gosh, I hope I'm getting the last name right, who sort of is the inventor in a way of digital storytelling. But, and he was an Apple fellow, I think, in the 90s. And I mean, it's in my book, I should know this. But um, I, I was really into his work in 15, almost 20 years ago. So he would like make this fake like fire play, uh, campfire on stage and they had a big screen behind him. And then he would sit down sort of like I'm sitting here on, on stage and just have a conversation and show pictures and show short movies, little home movies, this and that. And I thought, well, that, that's great. That's the kind of the way I was doing it in high school with the 35 millimeter slides. 
So it's nothing new. TED isn't really new in a way. I mean, it's sort of like when people think a ketogenic diet, diet is somehow a fad when it's how humans have been eating for like, you know, 100,000 years. So <laughs> humans have been presenting, you know, around campfires long before, but the screens have been around for what, I don't know, 100 years or so. Yeah. I mean, Excellent. long before PowerPoint, we were, I mean, there are home movies and things like that, or the, well, you're too young to remember, but when I was little, it would be like, you know, Uncle Ted would come over with the 35 millimeter Kodak carousel and click, click. And that was a very boring presentation style, but it, it could have been great. Oh, yes. No, I've, I'm very familiar with a slideshow uh, classic and they can be amazing. And I love that you brought up of what's next is actually what was and what is and what has been, which is our natural ability to tell stories that is based on personal experience. And I think something that is worth highlighting that you were talking about with regards to memorization is instead of going word for word and trying to become somehow a natural robot, actually being clear about your key messages, yeah. how they relate, each key messages relates to the image, which is actually reinforcing your key message, not the other way around, and mm -hmm. that you've got an objective to achieve. And that objective is not just information, which around the campfire, it's, it's connection, it's wisdom, it's passing on, um, wonder and engagement with the environment and how to survive or how to how to live better. So thank you very much for bringing up the campfire origin because that's 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 right. Yeah, and information as well, such as how to not be killed by a bear and things like that. So there are important stories where their technical information can be conveyed as well. What I'm amazed now is actually people uh, making video. And so like the word YouTuber is almost how blogger was a little bit you know, uh, dismissed as sort of, oh, bloggers, like not real reporters or real content creators. And the YouTuber was a name that, you know, YouTuber, you think, I don't want to say people's names, but you just think of sort of idiots out there doing things, you know, yo, what's up, like and subscribe and all that stuff. But now there are, there's so much great content and it's visually well done. These are not professionals. Uh, sometimes it's just with an, an iPhone, but they know they've learned the basics of uh, cinematography or video, you know, videography, as well as photography. And there's some really great content from, I mean, there just must be, just my genre is sort of like outdoors that I'm really interested in outdoors thing and built as a guy building log cabins in Canada. And that's just fascinating to me. And I wouldn't have watched that kind of stuff before because it wasn't produced very well. And I don't mean reality shows. I mean, just one guy or one woman producing really good things. And I kind of think that's where we're going as well. So people ask, well, how can I do a TED Talk? Or I mean, I want to do a TED Talk. No one asked me to do a TED Talk. Well, screw that. Make your own TED Talk. You could do it, film yourself. And so you, the YouTubers, some, some of those that are quite famous and doing very well, are sort of like that. They just went, why wait for permission? You have, I mean, the technology we have, we're fortunate to have. It could be as simple as, as an iPhone uh, or you know, a MacBook, and that's enough to make something really great and put it up there. And if it's good- I love it. We'll watch <laughs> it's like, it. I see like TEDx, my living room. Yeah. <laughs> TEDx, my campsite, <laughs> where where this is taking place. And I, that's, a, that's a really interesting point about the trend with video, which relates back to authenticity, not being perfect, but also having this real expression and storytelling. Yeah, you um, can make your yeah. own presentations. I mean, video your presentations, put that up. I mean, people like writers will say, well, I write, I, how can I get my book published? And I go, well, publish it yourself, you know, put it online, put it out there, just write, you know, give it, it away. I mean, uh, put, put some chapters up, whatever. And no, Do no it. one comes to you, right? You have to, what's the old Chinese expression? You have to sit by the river a long time before roast duck will fly into your mouth. <laughs> Something like that, right? So you, I mean, you have I to, like the visual. I like the visual of this adage. In other words, um, that'll never happen. So you have to. No, of course, of course, absolutely. Um, okay, Gar, we've talked a little bit about you know what you like, and and frankly, I'm curious to hear what makes you passionate about communication. But let's not go there yet. Before we go to passion, what's what frustrates you most about presentations? Um, yeah, and perhaps after you started writing about them, like, what stuff yeah. gets on your nerves? I still have moments. Do you remember John McEnroe, the tennis player? 
The great, so this is how young you are. I think it's Phil is not a, my subject. Anyway, John McEnroe, who's still a, f a very famous figure, but anyway, he used to get really uh, angry. And one of his most famous lines is, uh, you know, you cannot be serious. So Phil might appreciate this. I have that moment often when I'll see something. And I don't say anything, but in my brain, the bubble above my head is, you cannot, because I'm throwing my tennis racket down. And often it's, yeah, it's the same old stuff because it's people who haven't, a lot of academics, uh, frankly, and of course, very smart people, very nice people. And they get up there and they'll present to, you know, 20 slides with, you know, 16 sentences. I mean, it's the same old thing. And and you go, you could say, well, that doesn't matter because their speaking was really good. And well, yeah, but then that's just a distraction. I mean, it just is, it's much better to have nothing than poor visuals. I mean, no visual, visuals are, better than no visuals in many, almost every case, not every case, but in most cases. But it is much better to have no visuals than to have really crappy visuals. I mean, it just takes away from the talk. So yeah, that kind of uh, very, very, very wordy slide. And you know, the cliches like, you know, can you, I know you can't see this, but I'm sure you can't see this past the first row, but, yes. or another one is blowing into the microphone. So that's, but that's because I'm an old musician. So you always check the mic by snapping. It. It's very bad for the mic if you blow your wet breath into it. So never do that. <laughs> Don't be a moist breather yeah. into the mic and no, avoid no. slide humans. Although I did recently see at a medical conference, this was interestingly done with a very experienced speaker who started the whole conference on urology with about 30 slides of the first page of an abstract. And the way he made that interesting, the moment that they saw the abstract, the speaker went, this looks familiar, right? We all know this page. Okay, so, and he would then ask a provocative question about the meaning of the abstract uh -huh. and the recent research. So that's how it can be done in a way that possibly makes sense and is interesting for the audience. But if you do expect them to read tiny font, <laughs> that's, that's just yeah. uh, an insult. Um, Okay, this, this question is just in from your dear friend, Phil Wakenall. Mm -hmm. Have you updated your Star Wars references? In <laughs> include the new episodes. Uh, no, uh, no, no, I did. I, I guess they're still in there a little bit, but uh, because for me, of course I saw um, um, six, no, no, sorry, seven, eight and nine uh, yeah. with my, now with my son, so it's great. But you know, for me, it's still, you know, four five and six or, that's really home for me. <laughs> so I, I think those will, those will stay. And there, there are lessons there that I didn't talk about. Like, um, I think uh, when George Lucas went and did, you know, one, two, and three, he didn't have his wife who was great. She was doing the editing. <laughs> She's the great editor. You need that kind of partner who would say, nah, yeah, <laughs> that doesn't look, that's too, too much CG or that's too much, you know, that's superfluous. I don't know. I don't know this for a fact, but I know that she was very important for the editing on the, the first movies. So maybe I had never George, heard that. Maybe George yeah. needed that, but that's not really relevant, uh, except that, you know, it's sometimes good to have a, another point of view, someone to sort of rein you in. I, I agree. Um, if you can find that partner who, who you can take the, I mean, like uh, Ricky Gervais had uh, Steve Merchant, right? And then there are other great, and you always need, well, think, give me some, Others. Well, co founders, Steve Jobs and Wozniak. Yeah. Paul, Paul Allen and Bill Gates, but can we think of anyone besides men? Michelle and Barack, my most favorite people on the planet. They are co founders for a reason. We need someone that we trust who's got a different perspective to be able to bounce ideas off of and make sure that they shine well. Um, yeah, I like that point a lot. And, and same thing when you're working on a presentation, don't do it in a silo you know, get, get feedback and see what's actually relevant or have I gone off on a tangent that's making me feel good, but makes sense out there. Um, so Gart, we're, we're getting close to our time here, but I want to ask a couple of- <gasps> Okay, this cat has just come in here. Say something. You know, you take, take. Oh, oh, these are- <laughs> yes. cat. Yeah, take Kona. Take cat tail. Cat oh, let go. Hi, everybody. Oh, sorry. This is a live lesson and how. Ah, okay. All right. I'll, I'll close the door. Close <laughs> the door. Almost finished. Thank you. I was, you know, conscientious, tried to be conscientious ma making the book that I put examples of, of, of women and, you know, photos of women presenting and all of that. It's very easy to just, you know, like many things, it, 
can be sort of male dominated. Who do you admire as presentation masters? Well, frankly, in the realm of authenticity and speaking from the heart, Michelle Obama is someone I deeply admire. I got to listen to her audiobook Becoming, and I now have an inner track of Michelle in my head, and I'm all the better for it. And Oprah. Uh, in fact, also Emma Watson. These are these are three women I really admire for their contribution to the world through the development of their inner voice, becoming their outer voice. And honestly, I think that the contribution part through transparency is what speaks to me the most about mm -hmm. those. Mm -hmm. um, Gar, because we're close to time and I wanna let you get back to your cat and your children. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna ask you a couple of lightning questions here. So the main point is to be as succinct as possible. Very few words. Oh, okay. Are you ready? Well, I'll do my best. What's your favorite non-presentation book? Oh, uh, uh, The Tao of Physics. What will your next book be about? Um, resilience. In That's true. <laughs> you <laughs> said succinct. OK, perfect. Perfect. Um, I'm teased. Mm -hmm. Why do you care so much about presentations? I don't really care about presentations, but I, I care about, you know, ideas and and sharing ideas that's why ted ripped off all my ideas because <laughs> i was doing it in the 70s so it's a great medium i mean actually i think writing is in some ways it's different in some ways better because you can you know say everything and not leave every, anything out and it's it's much it's a much different medium but i in some ways i think it's 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 better but uh, presenting or public speaking is, is a great complement uh to writing and but it can't just be the information where you know the book even good writing obviously even good science writing still has has to connect with the audience um, but public speaking has to have of course great information but we're humans and we have to connect with other humans to get our messages across so i think it's uh, as important as it's ever been can you finish with a short plug for your latest book presentation oh then? no three but in a Yoda. <laughs> mm, buy it, you must. Uh, you know, I, I can't, I don't like to promote, you know, my own own books, even though this is like the best selling, you know, presentation book in the history of the known universe. There may be multiverses, but at least in this universe, it seems to be uh, very popular. So I would appreciate it. If you already have a copy of the presentations and the second edition, uh, then still get this, but give that, you know, give that to somebody, give it to a friend. And if you have the first edition, well, then you really need to use that as a doorstop and, and get this one. But if you really don't want to buy a book, I understand because, you know, clutter and simplicity. And uh, I'll try to give away everything for free online. It's mostly up there anyway. Gar, thank you so much. And as the final words here to those who are interested in, in spreading their ideas, and as you said, connecting with other humans to make sure that important messages are shared and received. Would you mind sharing with us, what is your mantra? What do you live by? What, what informs your work? Ah, uh, I don't know if I have a mantra, but um, I say it all the time. And I, th I just think it's because I'm cognitively challenged perhaps, or, or I have attention, some sort of attention deficit disorder. But I just say, you know, as simple as possible, as simple as possible, because it's always going to end up being complicated anyway. So I always try to bring it back as simple as possible. But as I think Einstein said, I'm not sure if he said it, but there's a quote attributed to him that he said, keep everything as simple as possible, but not too simple. So that means don't, don't lie, don't obfuscate. But to, you just got to keep trying to, you know, if you can do it with 10 bits, don't do it with 20. And it's something we just have to keep uh, reminding ourselves to simplify, simplify as much as we can. Uh, it's, it's just a crazy world compared to the time when I was in high school where we had like five things to remember in a year. And now it's like 1500 things a day. It's just, it's crazy. So I think the, you know, the, the victory goes to those who can simplify, simplify the message without dumbing it down, but simplifying and, and connecting will take you really far. Thank you so much for your time. I feel like I've learned 
uh, some new information, but mostly just heard what I needed to to give more meaning to the work I do. So thank you, Gar. And well, no, thank you. I, I love ideas on stage and I love what you're doing there in Paris. And I will be coming to Paris maybe, you know, ne next year. And we'll do a presentation seminar in a studio there. So a little ideas on stage presentation yes. then. Yeah, yeah. Sounds great. Thank you, Gar. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye bye. If you enjoyed this episode of the Ideas on Stage podcast, there are many more you might like. So please subscribe, leave us a review, and tell us what you think. You can find many more ideas on business communication at ideasonstage.com or by searching for Ideas on Stage on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and goodbye for now.